Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Moments uh, OPC. To all those that are visiting, please stick around for coffee uh, downstairs after the service. Let's now um, uh, have a time of silent prayer, preparing to worship God. somebody, you're determining somebody 
you're ordaining somebody to come up here and just smack me in the head or something like that. If you force that person to do that, if you're willing them to do that, that can deprive them of their choice, especially if it's against their will. So how can it be that God wills certain things to happen, wills and determines that certain people are going to put their faith in Jesus Christ, for instance, um, without going against our will, without doing violence to our will, making us robots? Well, you see, the Bible says certain things about how um, it says God is a rock. That doesn't mean God is literally a rock. God, or the God has a strong arm. It doesn't mean he literally has a physical arm. God uses what's called anthropomorphic language. He uses language that it's creaturely language to help us to know him, even though we can't fully wrap our minds around him. So when the Bible talks about God determining things, God willing things, it's not the same way that you would determine somebody to smack me in the head. It's not the same way you would will something. God's will, just like his entire, well, God's entire being, including his will, is on a whole other level than ours. He is transcendent. He's transcendent. And because of that, because of the way he's ordained things, it actually gives us real choices that really matter and real responsibility, real guilt for our sin. So I'll read the section. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. For our song of response, we turn in the same psaltery hymnal to number 56. Number 56.
Ezra chapter 2. <coughs> Ezra chapter 2. So, we have just learned in Ezra chapter 1, last week, that Cyrus was an instrument of God. God was using Cyrus, the king of Persia, to bring back, or at least to begin to bring back, his people from exile back into the land of Israel. And as we have read in our evening readings from Jeremiah, when we read from, for those who are visiting, we read from Jeremiah in the evenings. We're going through Jeremiah right now, and then we're, we just started Ezra. In Jer Jeremiah 29, we learned that one of the things God was commanding the people in exile was to be fruitful and multiply. In this chapter, Ezra 2, we see a long list of many, many names, thousands of people. Um, we see that the people of God have been fruitful and multiplying in exile. We see that we see these lists of names which people can be tempted to, we can be tempted to tune out at. But we learn here that God cares about people. God cares about his people and individual names, individual families. He loves Christian families. We see the same thing in the New Testament at the end and the greetings and the closings of different epistles, many different names listed that we can easily ignore. But God knows our names. He cares about his people. We also see at the end of this chapter that certain um, people that claim to be Levites or thought they were Levites did not have proof of their ancestry, that they were descended from Levi, so they were barred from participating or from participating in priestly duties. This is evidence that the people of God returning from exile, they cared about the worship of God. They cared about God's regulative principle of worship, that we must worship Him according to what He's commanded us, what He's prescribed in His Word. And non-Levites were not allowed to participate. They were not just doing what they wanted to do or what was convenient. They did not do the easy thing, just let them serve as priests, but they really cared about Honoring God, worshiping as he is commanded. So, I will read this chapter. Ezra chapter 2. Now, these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive into Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Baana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Ara, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Joshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Bani, 642. The sons of Debai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Adonikam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2,056. The sons of Adin, 454. The sons of Atter, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bezai, 323. The sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashem, 223. Sons of Gibbar, 95. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Netophah, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Arim, Shepharat, and Beeroth, 743. The sons of Ramah and Geba, 621. The son, sorry, the men of Mikmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magnish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Harim, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Sinah, 3,630. The priests, the sons of Jediah, of the house of Joshua, 973. Sons of Immer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Harim, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Joshua and Cadmiel, the sons of Hodaviah, 74. The 
The singers, the sons of Asaph, 128. Sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atur, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shobai, and all, 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tabaoth, the sons of Keras, the sons of Siaha, the sons of Padon, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Sham Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Jahar, the sons of Riyah, the sons of Razin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Neumim, the sons of Nephesim, the sons of Bakbuk, Bakbuk, the sons of sorry, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harbur, the sons of Basileth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkas, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tamad, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa, the sons of, <laughs> sorry, long list, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Satai, the sons of Hasaferet, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkhan, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pekareth Hazabaim, the sons of Ami. The temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. Following were those who came up from Tel Telmela, Telharsha, Cherub, Adan, and Immer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652. Also the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai and the Gileadite, was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. And they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736. Their mules were 245. Their camels were 435. And their donkeys were 7,000, sorry, 6,720. Some of the heads of the families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 darics of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priest garments. Now, the priests, the Levites, and some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns, and all the rest of Israel in their towns. All right, let's now turn to our God for a time of congregational prayer. Almighty God, most merciful Father, we praise you for saving an innumerable multitude of souls already, and for all the souls that you are saving now and are going to save. We thank you, Lord, that you know the names of every single one of your people. You have written us in your book of life, and Lord, you will not um, send your Son back to this world until every single one of your elect has been brought in, has been brought into your fold. You love us that much, and we praise you for this, Lord. We praise you for your eternality, that you are from eternity to eternity, you are God. And Lord, we are but a breath. What is our life? We are but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Oh God, we do not have as much time as it feels. And we confess that we have squandered our time use in many ways, through laziness, through procrastination, through foolish pursuits, through doing things that are second priorities when we need to be doing something of first priority. We have sinned against you in many ways, Lord. We have even used, squandered our time in things that are, that are outright dishonoring to you and offensive to you. And Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us for our, our many sins, our many sins, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life for us in all of his 33 years, never sinning in thought, word, and deed, and gave his life, Lord, all for your glory, Lord, and saving lost sinners like us who have squandered many years. We pray that by your Holy Spirit you would empower us to use our time better. You would empower us to spend the rest of our days serving you joyfully, Lord, that we would make best use of the time, that you would help us to redeem the time for the days are evil. Would you teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom and serve you diligently. Would you help us, Lord, even in even now to uh, sanctify this holy day and Lord especially in the times of corporate worship today both morning and evening that you would help us to make best use of the time that we would seek to worship you with all of our hearts that you would protect our minds from wandering as they so easily do and we pray that you would help us to rejoice in the time that we get to with you in your presence and in the presence of your people we pray Lord for our community we pray, Lord, for our nation at large, that you would turn this nation from wasting time. You would turn us towards productivity. You would help us to not pursue, help this land to no longer pursue fruitless, vain things, Lord. But you would cause people to seek the Lord while, while during the time in which you may be found, to call upon you while you are near. For the day is coming when our lives will all end and it will be too late. Lord God, we pray that you would cause your, you would expand your kingdom in this world. You would sweep many people in, Lord, and you would cause this land to give their lives, give their time to serving the Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for healing for our youngest member, Lord. We pray also for um, um, Bob's uncle, who is right now... Um, going through a very hard time, Lord, and uh, we pray that wherever he is, Lord, you would help people to find him and, and, and to help him, Lord, as he uh, is not doing well. We pray, Father, for um, the rest of our day here. We pray for our, that you would help us now to worship you from our hearts in spirit and in truth, and may your word go forth with power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For our song of preparation, we turn in the Trinity Psalter hymnal again to number 388, number 388.
Almighty God, most merciful Father, we pray that now as we turn to your word, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray, Lord God, that your word would hit the bullseye today, that your intended meaning would come across to every heart, that we would all, um, you would open our eyes that we may see marvelous things out of your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the hope of the second coming of Christ, Lord, which the Apostle Peter tells us of. We thank you, Lord, for he is coming back, and he has mansions prepared for us. We pray that you would um, be present with us now by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we turn now to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 10. I'll say it once more. 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 10. We'll start at verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere minds by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But... Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Has the doubt ever crossed your mind that Jesus is not going to come back? Maybe you've considered many different cult leaders, many different religious groups that have claimed to know the specific day that Jesus was going to come back, and then that day comes, and they're disappointed exposed to be false, oftentimes false prophets. Maybe, have you ever doubted or worried that Jesus is not going to come back, that our hopes are in vain, when you've considered the different atrocities that have happened throughout human history, or atrocities happening in our current day? Well, believers might struggle with these doubts about the future. Imagine how much more difficult it would be if there were false teachers in our own churches that were mocking those, scoffing at those that believed in the second coming, that believed Jesus was going to come back, that there would be a heaven and a hell. People making fun of us. And people putting together arguments that sound convincing that he's actually not going to come back. How much more difficult and confusing would that be, especially for new believers? Well, this was Peter's situation. The churches were having scoffers coming in that were spreading lies, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Peter outlines the argument of these false teachers in verse 4. And there are two parts. There, part A of verse 4 is a question of skepticism. A question of skepticism. Verse 4, part A, or I'll say 4A. Where is the promise of his coming? Part B of verse 4 said, gives the reason which backs up the question, 
which is that basically they're saying things have remained the same. God hasn't intervened in the past. Our three points today are in the outline, and we are going to um, try to do justice to Peter's line of reasoning, refuting their argument, refuting their argument. Our first point will be explaining the foretold false teaching which Peter outlines. Our second point will be they overlook God's works. They overlook God's works, which is Peter's refutation of their premise, or um, part 4B, four, four, four the reason which backs up their skeptical conclusion. And our third point will be don't overlook God's faithfulness. Don't overlook God's faithfulness, which is Peter's refutation of their skeptical conclusion, which is where is the promise of his coming. So uh, bear with me as I try to do justice to just Peter's line of argument here. Starting in for our first point, I'll, I'll read the verses one more time, uh, the foretold for false teaching. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. After many, so after many strong words in chapter 2, Peter reassures the elect of his love for them, calling them beloved, calling them beloved in verse 1. He noted that it was prophesied that these false teachers were going to come. He said that the prophets and the apostles both warned of it. In other words, the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of Scripture has warned about these things. And that in itself is an argument against the false teachers. We should, we knew this was coming. They should have known this was coming. We don't have to consider whether it's Jesus wants us to actually believe what they're saying or not. No. He told us these people were coming. If they contradict the Bible, we shouldn't listen to them. Um... <coughs> And their false doctrine, we see in verse 3, was bolstering their wicked practice. Bolstering their wicked practice, as it says, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. See, their false doctrine and their, false, their sinful living is hand in hand. We see um, that their skepticism about the coming judgment, the second coming of Christ, was allowing them to be at ease in Zion, to be relaxed about their, their morals. As it says in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. So because they don't see the punishment, the judgment of the wicked coming, they feel free to go live in wickedness. And they scoff at those that say that judgment is coming. And because they say judgment is not coming, it gives them more and more peace as they pursue wickedness. And as they pursue wickedness, they don't want to believe in the judgment. It scares them even more. It's a horrible, toxic cycle that they're in. But these people, they're like certain misbehaved kids, that their, their parents are gone, they're home alone, and they're, they're saying, you know, that mom and dad are not going to come back for a while, and they do some wild, crazy thing. And then there's a, there's a you know a well-behaved sibling that's saying, don't do that, mom and dad. They could come back any moment. You, you could get caught. You, you need to stop doing that. And they just mock and bully that kid. That's like these false teachers that are saying, you know, Jesus is not coming back. And it, that doctrine enables them to live wickedly. So what, what exactly is their false teaching? Peter outlines their argument. He represents their argument in verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. The argument has a conclusion and a premise to back it up. A conclusion and a premise to back it up. The conclusion is a questioning of God's faithfulness to his promises. That is, where is the promise of his coming? So he, he's not, it's almost as if they're saying he, he's not coming back. That's their conclusion. They question the faithfulness of God. And conclusions are backed up by premises. The premise that backs up the skeptical conclusion is a false understanding of history. 
that as if God has never intervened in the world. As they said, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Is that true? No. But that's what they're saying. That is their premise. The whole argument is basically this. 4b, God hasn't worked in the past. And 4a, so why trust his promise of coming back in the future? He hasn't worked in the past. Why should we believe he's going to keep his promise to come back? That's basically what they're saying. The Apostle will now respond to these two errors about God's work in the past and his faithfulness to work in the future in the rest of verses 5 through 10. First, he deals with God's work in the past. And that will be our second point. Starting in, uh, which is that they overlook God's works. They overlook God's works. Starting in verse 5. For they deliberately overlook this fact. Why do they say deliberately? Deliberately. They are willingly ignorant here. They don't want to think about certain things that would interfere with their already accepted conclusions and interrupt their sinful lifestyle. They're purposefully ignorant. In this case, it's about the works of God in the past, particularly during his work in creation week and at the flood, um, which show that God, these, these events, particularly Creation Week and the Flood, they show, they're pictures of God's immense power to work at a global level, which is something that's going to happen in the future when Jesus comes back. It's difficult to convince people differently if they deeply don't want to accept your conclusion. They're horribly afraid of the implications of accepting your conclusion. What about us? Is there a lesson we can learn here from this word deliberately? Are there certain passages, doctrines, commands in the Bible that we prefer to be ignorant of, that we don't want to think about, that make us uncomfortable, that make us angry, that make us offended, that we deliberately overlook? Some may veer towards a Christian life where you read just devotional books, and particularly devotional books that don't challenge or tell us we're doing anything wrong or believing anything wrong, and getting offended when people try to um, say that they're doing something wrong. Or every single one of us, sometimes we find things that may make us uncomfortable in the Bible or make us cringe. Some people try to avoid that um, conviction of the flesh by just saying, well, that's just your interpretation. It means that to you. It doesn't mean that to me. Or they may try to twist the original languages. Like that's, that's not what the author was intending to even say. And the translations have messed it up. James, the Apostle James, um, tells us what our, the right attitude towards the word is. In James 1.19, he says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So, people often use this as having an application for how we should always live, always being slow to speak, etc., etc. And that's true, we should always try to be like that. But this verse falls right between different verses that are talking about the Word of God specifically. And we can conclude that that verse is specifically intended to represent what our attitude should be towards the Word of God. That we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. That we should humbly receive what the Word of God says. Hebrews 13, 22 says that we must suffer the word of exhortation or patiently listen to or Bear with the preaching of the Word. It won't always be comfortable to read or listen to the Word of God or listen to preaching of the Word of God. But something that helps me is a quote that I heard, that if the Bible is stepping on my toes, my feet are probably in the wrong place. My feet are probably in the wrong place. So what do these false teachers overlook? What are they deliberately overlooking? They're deliberately overlooking God's most obvious, large-scale events that have ever happened. Verse 5, they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And then he talks about the global flood in verse 6. 
Think about the supernatural miracle of creation by the Word of God. They overlook God's work in creating the heavens, then creating a watery earth, and then bringing dry land in that watery earth, separating it. He's naming three massive acts of God. Creation as a whole, the heavens and the earth, then the earth, which is all watery, and then the separation of the waters. We also know that there was water above, water above that God was going to use in the flood and from the creation narrative. Um, Peter focuses on water here because he's setting himself up for his next argument against the false teachers, which is the flood. All this water was well, setting the stage for the flood. It was as if God had a bow that was ready and it was aimed at the wicked. And at the flood, all that water came down and the bow was fired. In verse 6, and that by means of these, or the water, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. See, it was all by God's word that all this stuff was created, that the flood came, God opened the windows of heaven, fired the arrow of the flood, and then he gave the rainbow, a bow in heaven, promising that he wouldn't flood the earth with water again. You see later that he's coming back with fire. So is it true what the theological liberals of their time were saying? That all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation? Clearly not. Clearly not. As a side note, Peter is using the creation and the flood as examples of God's undeniable, global, immediate activity intervening in the world. Peter was not a deist, that God set the world in motion, that it's all just a cause of just a, a huge line of different causes and effects, and God has stayed distant as a passive spectator. Peter's using biblical, geological history to show God was intervening mightily. But now, today, we have professing Christians, such as some theistic evolutionists, who are taking the side of these ancient heretics and the more recent false doctrine of deism, arguing that God has stepped back and doesn't intervene in the world and has sort of let these things evolve and change over time without supernatural divine intervention at a global level. But you see, if the creation wasn't a gigantic work of God's supernatural power, immediate, then Peter wouldn't be refuting the heretics. He would be agreeing with them. He would be saying, I agree, God hasn't massively intervened and acted throughout world history. These same theologically liberal syncretists of often argue that the flood was not a global event, but it was a local flood. It was a local flood. And the writers of the Old Testament were just describing it as a global event. But again, those that think Peter was just talking about a local flood make Peter out to be agreeing with the heretics. Peter is mentioning all these global, massive events because the second coming of Christ will be a global, massive, immediate event, supernatural intervention of God. Whereas these people are saying that God, God hasn't been intervening in the world. Right? If the flood was local, the, you know, the, these heretics probably agree with that. The heretics believe local floods happen all the time. Who'd, local floods happen in the U.S. in recent years, in Kentucky. Local floods are, and if the flood was just local, God has broken the Noahic covenant thousands of times. Thousands of times. Another implication would be, would the second coming just be a local second coming? But Peter's using the flood as a parallel to the global, not local, but global effects of the second coming in the next verse, verse 7, which says, By the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So in summary, the heretics were saying in verse 4 that, For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter shows this is flat out wrong. 
This is flat out wrong. God has intervened. God's word was fulfilled at creation, the separation of the waters, the flood, and that is why we can trust his word to be fulfilled when Jesus comes back in the future. This leads us to point three. Don't overlook God's faithfulness. Don't overlook God's faithfulness. Let's turn to verse 8. Verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. We see here that Peter's or that, sorry, God's perspective on time is radically different than our perspective on time. What might feel like an eternity to the false teachers then, where they haven't seen God do anything, you know, in a supernatural intervening way, was just a blip in God's timetable. In God's, think about this, at the time of the false teachers of this day, think about how many human beings were on the earth at that time. Well, right now in our day, there are more Christians alive today than there were at their time human beings. There are more Christians on earth today than there were human beings on earth then. So what if the heretics got, what, what if Jesus actually did come back when the heretics were saying that? Well, what would happen to us? There were multiple continents that had not heard the gospel yet. You see, God was not being slow. God was being patient, and his plan was to save millions, billions, an innumerable multitude of sinners. If he came back then, what would become of us? What would become of those people that were about to hear the gospel? You see, God's timetable is different than ours, and we should be thankful about that. We should be thankful about that. Mark Dever notes that, think about the Jews that waited thousands of years for the Messiah to come. There definitely would have been scoffers then saying, oh, he's, he's not going to come. He's not going to come. It's been so long. It's been so long. God, but as Mark Dever says, God is not forgetful, but eternal. God is not forgetful, but eternal. You see, this perspective of time and the faithfulness of God is something we must not overlook. The False teachers were twisting the spans of time in history to try and question God's faithfulness to his promise for the future. They said, where is the promise of his coming? But when we see that this delay, or not delay, but this time span reveals his patience, we fortify ourselves against the taunts of the wicked and the doubts of our own mind. Throughout the Psalms, the wicked would always say, where is your God? Where is your God? And now this New Testament version is, where is the promise of his coming? The answer to those enemies of the church that blaspheme God as if he is delaying or idle is that he's being patient with you. Come to repentance. Come to repentance. He's withholding his wrath. He's saving sinners by the millions. We also learn lessons that we can apply to our personal lives here. We often fail to learn that while God can give us immediately the things that we pray for right after we pray, he, doesn't, he, often, he often doesn't work like that. He sometimes desires us to pray for years for something, which teaches us faith, it teaches us patience, teaches us endurance, it makes us stronger, and then when the blessing that we pray for comes, it teaches us to be thankful. You see, otherwise we could easily become entitled or we can take things for granted. If you have manna falling from heaven every day, think about how easy that would be to take it for granted after year number 37. It would be easy to take it for granted. God's timetable is different than ours. But also there are even more serious matters than just you know the sort of normal sorts of prayers that we pray, but sometimes there are really hard spiritual trials that are weighty, that are agonizing, and it can feel endless, and we can be tempted to distrust God or be skeptical about God. What Christian family doesn't have a loved one that has wandered away from Christ that brings tears to our eyes in prayer? There are some suffering with painful diseases, disabilities, or 
other things, mourning, which, and it seems to be endless, it seems to be endless, but we must keep praying, knowing that God's timing is perfect. We must not give way to the temptations to think that God is delaying or God doesn't care. No. Because we see in this text that what may appear to delay a son is really God's patience, love, and it is his faithfulness, if we view it from the right perspective. Another lesson this text teaches us about how, you know, a thousand, a thousand years is but a day to God is how brief life is. If a thousand years is but a day to God, then how much is 80 years? How much is a lifespan? How much is one year? Moses calls our attention to this in Psalm 90. Psalm 90 was written by Moses, which Peter is referencing here, which says in Psalm 90, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as the watch in the night. He also says the years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength, eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In light of the brevity of this life, you should. how important is it that we consider, as Rud Rudyard Kipling noted, that we should fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. How will we spend the rest of our lives? How do you want to spend the rest of your life? What endeavors for Jesus Christ do you want to pursue with the time that you have left? What habits need to be cultivated for the improvement of our time on a daily basis to know Christ better, to help others know Him better? You know that there are one of the best things, one of the most good things in this world, in this life now, that we will never be able to do when we're in heaven, is share the gospel with those that don't know Christ. It's our last chance right now. It's our last chance right now. Whether it's through hospitality, whether it's through evangelism, however that looks like, whether that's giving sacrificially towards the advance of the gospel, we should make the best use of the time. Our time is more precious to gold than gold. Jesus died to redeem our time from the distractions of the devil. He gave his whole life for us. And we should give our lifespans back to him. If any here do not know Jesus Christ today, it's time to make a choice. How will you spend the rest of your life? How will you spend eternity? If you come to Christ, you will have eternal life. And not just eternal life in heaven, but this life itself will be redeemed. The next verse tells us that God's delay, as we've talked about, is not due to any slowness or idleness, and that His promise can be trusted. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's seeking to refute their challenge here. Where is the promise of his coming? As he says, he's not slow to fulfill his promise. That's what the word promise is referencing. The false teachers look at the span of time, conclude that God is faithless. The believer looks at the t span of time, concludes God is faithful. God is faithful. You see, he's faithful, not wishing that any should perish. It says he's patient towards you. Well, who is this written to? 1 Peter, it's the same, he says it's the second letter I'm writing to you. The first one, 1 Peter, the first verse of 1 Peter chapter 1, it says to the elect exiles. We see it, we saw in 2 Peter chapter 1, make your calling and election sure. He said he's patient towards you. Who is he patient towards? It's towards the elect, it's towards his chosen people. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Jesus will not come back. He will hold back the advance of his armies of angels until every single one of his chosen people has been brought into the fold. We should praise God for that. And he is coming back. Verse 10. But the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
happen like a thief. He's coming back like a thief. That means that we don't know when it's going to happen. Peter's using Jesus' analogy from the Gospels of a coming thief. It will be a surprise. We don't know when it's going to happen. All those throughout history that have tried to predict it and pin down a day when they think it's going to happen, okay, wrong. They're not supposed to be even doing that. It's coming like a thief. While it's going to be a surprise, we are supposed to prepare for it, not predict it. Prepare for it, not predict it. Think about this. Imagine someone just rides around without a seatbelt on the highways, and they're just like, well, if I'm going to get into a car accident, I'll put on the seatbelt really, qu really, really quick before the car accident. You can't, you can't do that. This is... It, happened, it takes you off guard. It will be a surprise if it happens. But that shows that we must be prepared. Peter is calling us to be prepared, not to predict. A destruction will come. God has sworn never to flood the earth again with water, but he will do it again with fire. The earth and what has been done will be exposed. And these false teachers, as it says, they live for their sinful desires. We saw in chapter 2, they wanted the praise of man. Their hearts were trained in greed, and they were filled with sexual lust. They lived for the creature rather than the creator. But soon, all those things they lived for, their true God, will be burned up entirely. Will be burned up entirely. So why would we live for it now? Why would we live for it now? God has not designed us just to stimulate our appetites merely or to collect possessions that we're going to lose, that will get burned up, or to just fill a social media account with followers and check it every day so we can feel something. God has made us to glorify Him, to enjoy Him forever. See, there was once a man named C.T. Studd who was born to a wealthy family in England he had the best education money could buy. But he decided to go to the mission field, dying at 81 years old in the Congo instead of in a mansion in England. Here's something he wrote. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. It's powerful words. Only what is done for Christ will last. So in conclusion, our message today, next time someone says, where, where is Christ? Why doesn't he come back? Or if, if, if God is good, why hasn't he come back and put a stop to this or that thing? He's trying to challenge you. He, he will. He's coming back. The reason why is because he's patient. So come to repentance while there's still time. Let's pray. Almighty God, most merciful Father, we look forward for that day, for Christ to come back, make all things new, and not just destroy these things that the false teachers were living for and that we we're tempted to live for, but to make a new heavens and a new earth, which we will uh, cover next week, Lord willing. We long for that day, for the new heavens and a new earth to dwell with you as our God. We long for that day of resurrection. We pray that you would fortify us against the doubts which arise from our flesh, against the taunts, the scoffing, the ridicule, people just being mean about what we believe. That you'd fortify us with your truth. You'd help us to refute every word of their arguments, as Peter has done here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our song of response, we turn in the Trinity Psalter hymnal to Psalm 90A. 90A.
resources. Lord, we pray that you give us grace, Lord, to give them back to you. We pray that you'd use our offering today for the advancement of your kingdom, Lord, that others may know you. And, Lord God, we pray for the Beth Shan Association. We pray that um, you be glorified through the rest of our day as well. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 